Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are The Minimalists. Ryan, we all like surprises, right? Mm-hmm. Surprise! <laughs> What'd you get me? Well, it's an unwelcome surprise, Ryan. <laughs> Isn't that funny, right? Because... If something is an unwelcome surprise, we call it a disruption, we call it a disturbance, mm. we call it an annoyance. Yeah. We don't usually call it a surprise, right? And yeah. That's what I want to talk to you about on today's public episode. We're going to talk about surprise purchases slash annoying purchases. Mm. And then this Thursday on the Minimalist Private Podcast, Ryan and I are going to talk to listeners about the occasions when their spouses, children, parents, and roommates have made purchases without telling them. We have a lot of fun examples with mm. this. Yeah. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalist. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Ryan, our first question today is from Forrest on Facebook. What's the difference between surprise purchases and impulse purchases? To me, they're the same and should be avoided at all costs. Pun intended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love a good pun. You know, Ryan, it's um I wanna I don't want to get bogged down in, in definitions. So if you are annoyed by a surprise purchase, then it's an annoying purchase. If it, mm. you're annoyed by an impulse purchase, then you know, but what is it? What does the purchase make you feel? If I go back to when we were kids, I think about Ella all the time now. If she, if she gets something and she's surprised by it, it is like all this overwhelming sort of joy, right? But if she's annoyed by something, there's also this overwhelming annoyance mm. by, you know, if the thing broke or the thing isn't working the way that the, the, the toy runs out of batteries. Mm it's really easy to get frustrated. And so maybe maybe they actually are the same thing. Hmm. Maybe a surpri any surprise is also an annoyance mm. on some spectrum. Yeah, it could be. So it's the, uh, the, the, the difference between an impulse, right? Mm -hmm. And an annoying purchase or a surprise purchase. Well, I mean, a surprise purchase is unplanned. Like that is... Yeah. So... Um, yeah, you know, your transmission goes out. Like mm -hmm. that's, I mean, maybe it's impulsive <laughs> because you have to fix transmission to get your car to work so you can get from point A to point B. It's definitely reactive. Yes, but but when I think of impulse purchases, I think about like when you're in the checkout line and you see, you know, the little plastic toys that I have to really talk myself out of buying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that's that's more of an impulsive thing, not as much as a surprise. So for me, the difference would be a surprise purchase is unavoidable. An impulse purchase is typically avoidable. Right, right. And so I guess it, we, it really depends what we mean by a surprise here too, right? Because the impulse purchase, what a great point, Ryan. If you're in the checkout line mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, oh, I should get this candy bar, I should get this pack of gum, I should buy this tchotchke, whatever it is, there's mm -hmm. this thing that I wasn't planning on buying. I didn't come to the store for this, mm -hmm. but since I see it, now I'm going to buy it. The biggest problem here is now we're constantly at the store because it's in our pocket. Mm. And so you're scrolling through Instagram and that ad for those shoes or that T-shirt or that dress or yeah. that hat pops up in your Instagram feed. Mm. And you say, oh, yeah. I And we tell ourselves the story. I've been meaning to get that. Or, ooh, I think... That looks great. It's beautiful. I would look great in that. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, it is an impulse purchase. Yeah. Or it's on sale. Oh, I have to get it because <laughs> right. it's on sale, right? I'd be stupid not to get it. <laughs> right. I, oh, and man. I don't want to waste this opportunity to, mm. to save 30%. Well, it's <laughs> this opportunity. <laughs> and, well, oh, here's the man. thing. It's 100% off if you don't buy it. Yeah. And and so yes, I'm I'm with you, man. There are some rules we have. So we have this minimalist rule book uh, for us. You can download it theminimalists.com/slash resources. We have a bunch of free resources over there, including the 16 rules for living with less. It's a free ebook you can download. One of the rules in there that'll help you is called the wait for it rule. Yeah. And 
This just goes, hey, if something costs more than thirty dollars, and mm-hmm. you can adjust that number, but for me, it's thirty bucks. Mm-hmm. I try to wait thirty hours. I call it the thirty thirty rule, right? Yeah. It's basically like, hey, if there's anything that's even a remotely substantial purchase, let me wait a day or so. Hence the thirty thirty rule, yeah. because quite often, instead of I'm scrolling through that Instagram feed, oh yeah, I really would like those shoes. Mm. And then I wait a day. I always think, oh, is that? Do I really want to spend seventy nine dollars? And which, by the way. $79. That might be a cheap pair of shoes. I'm wait, should I Google this company? I've never even heard of this company. Mm. Maybe they're a scam. Maybe they make really poor quality stuff with really great advertisements. It looks really shiny. The facade yeah. is, but there's nothing inside. Maybe it's actually a piece of junk. And I think many of our impulse purchases, and then by proxy, many of our surprise purchases mm. are junk. Yeah. It's interesting because it has me thinking that surprise purchases, something like the 30-30 rule may not work because going back to that transmission thing, Mm -hmm. it's like you're not going to wait 30 hours right, (laughs) to be like, well, do I need my car or not? Like it's probably something you have to take care of as soon as possible. Yes. Um, So again, just to highlight the difference between the surprise purchase and uh, yeah, and an impulse purchase. I'll tell you what, man, it's kind of scary like where we're going with shopping. So you mentioned... Uh, how you know we have a shop we have a shopping cart in our pocket oh, yes <laughs> we were just one click away from buying so many things and what i worry about um i don't know if you've seen like face or i guess meta whatever facebook metaverse whatever you want to call it they just launched their virtual reality shopping store like it's a maybe it's in beta testing but i've it's heard like, about it yeah it's it's uh it's in i guess it's a walmart technically and oh yeah, really yeah so like i just i don't know man that's where it's going and we can't stop it right and uh th- that's okay like i'm not against you know advancements in technology um but but you know that's that's why we talk about the conversations we have is because it's not going to get better it's it's only going to get worse it's only going to get more tempting yeah and yeah we've got to we we've, we've got to have some of those boundaries put in place otherwise um yeah, uh, we will give in to these impulses. Yes. Yeah. I, I look at surprise purchases as though there's there's two different kinds, really. And there, there may be more than two, but there's the kind where, like the transmission, like, oh, God, I that's a terrible surprise. I'm annoyed yeah. by it, right? Yeah. And then there's these surprise purchases that are thrust upon you uh, onto you by other people, mm. right? And so maybe it's someone you're living with. They come home with the... You know, with whatever purchase for the home. Hey, look, I bought a new couch. All of a sudden, you'd be <laughs> like, what? Yeah. yeah. Now, now, for some people, it could be like, oh, my God, we've been talking for a while. Or we've really wanted a new couch. I surprised you with one. But for the most part, if someone bombards you, barges into your home mm. and reverse shoplifts something into your home, <laughs> I, I, for me, there's there's nothing you could bring into my home that I can think of that would add immense value to my life unless I was already thinking about getting it. Mm. I, because in a surprise for me, I didn't make that decision intentionally. Even if you would give me a surprise party, which sounds like a nightmare for me, <laughs> it, I, I don't ever want to be surprised. And so I get that some people have a value system where they're like, oh, yes, it's really great. I want you to surprise me. I, I enjoy the spontaneity and I'm all for being sp- spontaneous. In fact, yeah. with my wife, every other Wednesday, we take the day off and this coming Wednesday, we're going to do this and we will spontaneously pick a place to go. And mm. it could be, hey, we're going to go to Venice and go to the beach. Hey, we're going to go up to Malibu Creek State Park and we're going to hang out there for the day and just walk in the sun. Or maybe we're going to go to a movie or maybe we're going to go to a neighborhood we've never been to before and explore. It's a spontaneous and it is a surprise to us. It's always surprising, but it's almost like planned surprise, (laughs) planned spontaneity. (laughs) That is so Joshua Fields Milburn. (laughs) Right. And and but because here's the thing, I've set my life up in a way, Ryan, Mm -hmm. where I do about three or four different things regularly. Mm. And that's all that I do, right? And then occasionally we'll go out and we'll try something new. But I've also figured out quite often what I like, what adds value to my life, what things add value to my life, what activities add value to my life, what types of people add value to my life. And 
and the amount. What's the because I get immense value from Ryan's and my relationship. Mm. But if we were spending 24 hours together every day, I would get far less value, which is the same thing with our stuff. Mm. We were just talking to a reporter before this uh, for the Columbus Dispatch, and um, which is the, the newspaper in Columbus, Ohio. And the thing that I was talking to, to him about, Ryan, was that uh, as a minimalist, it's a paradox. I get far more value from my things today mm. than before I, I was a minimalist, yeah. when I had so many things, but I didn't get a whole lot of value. And then the value sort of per capita, the value per item is so much more because I don't have all these surprises. I know what I get value from. And so, no, I'm not against surprises, but I think the truth is if we're not intentional about the things that we let into our lives, the things we bring into our lives, then we let anything in and it ends up being an annoyance for us. Let's move on to our callers, Ryan. If you have a question or comment for our podcast, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We have a question here from Christy in St. Louis. I was just at work reading a bunch of articles about Amazon's new products that they're releasing, like the Echo Microwave and um, Alexa in your car and everything, and it is just mind-blowing to me that our society has become lazy enough to where we don't even want to press buttons to cook a potato. We have to have a voice um, to cook our potato. So I was wondering what your guys' thoughts on that is because to me it's mind-blowing and everybody seems super excited about it, but I just can't believe this is where we've came as a society. Alexa, kill Ryan Nicodemus. <laughs> <laughs> Calling Ryan Nicodemus. Oh, I'm foiled again. <laughs> oh, man. Cooking a potato. With your voice, it man, it sounds it sounds like there are probably some exceptions where this might be really useful for some. But I do agree that like we are heading towards this Wally type dystopia. So the the movie Wally, where yeah, there's a robot and humans have basically got to a point where they're just kind of hovering around in in this entertainment chair that feeds them and and they watch TV and like they don't move and none of them can can walk because they have evolved uh to, to just be, you know, fat and lazy basically. And it, it is disturbing, man, but like I said, you know, like I said earlier, we we can't stop it. It's coming. Yeah. And if we allow it to, it will take over our lives. And right now though, right now, we have the opportunity to start setting up some boundaries, to start behaving in a way that we won't be taken over by those things. Um, the the VR stuff is really, I, I'm I'm like fifty percent passionate about it because I know that like this is going to be the next kind of wave of technology, and I think there will be some cool stuff. Like I would love, um, you know, to go hiking up Count, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro without actually having to hike it. <laughs> <laughs> and you could put on a VR headset. I think they actually do have some similar stuff like this. Or even better, I was thinking about um if you uh if you can like have a company that basically I'm giving away I'm giving away my million dollar ideas here. But if you could have a like a tourist company where you're like, "Oh, I want to go to Shanghai." Yeah. Uh but I want to do it from the my, you know, my home, mm -hmm. then you could have someone with a camera walking around. You could put your VR headset on and maybe direct them where to go. "Oh, that looks like a nice whatever. Let's go in there. Let's go to this museum." Yeah. Whatever it may be. So I think there's some really cool things that are around the corner with VR. But the other 50% of me is very worried like Christy is here. Like it's going to, oh my God, as soon as they can like simulate sex, it's over. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's over. <laughs> yeah, but even things that are much more sort of banal. I mean, I, I saw what's the CES consumer electronics show um, out in Vegas. I saw a video from that recently. And there was this company that just made doors that open on their own in front of you. Like when you go to a grocery store, yeah. you know how the, the door just slides open in front of you? Yeah. Well, it's just regular doors in your home now. So the door to your bedroom, you can walk in front of it and it just opens. And my first thought is, oh, that's so cool. But I'm like, Josh, you can't turn a knob. <laughs> like, by the way, I barely ever even shut my bedroom door. Why would I want to like decrease the airflow in my home? And now, but it looks cool. Oh, it's very Star Trek-esque. Mm. And so I'm with you, Christy. I, I 
I totally get that it's like, hey, where are we going with this? Do we really need that? But here's what I'll say. There are a lot of things you're used to using right now that people said the same thing about. People are getting so lazy, they can't even wash their clothes by hand anymore. Right. You have to have a washing machine? Yeah. What yeah. is wrong with people? I, this was the conversation that was going on a generation or two ago, yeah. right? Yeah. And we have a friend, Leo Babalta. His whole family uses a washing machine to wash their clothes. He washes clothes in the sink still just to prove that he can you know, get by with very little. He can live simply. Yeah. He doesn't need to hop on the hedonic treadmill. And so a lot of these things, like I have a dishwasher in our apartment. I've never used it once. Mm. A lot of people use their dishwasher every day, and that's okay. It's fine. But mm. I don't use it. I prefer to wash the dishes on my own. I prefer to open my own doors and not have Siri do it. Mm. I. But there are other things where it is convenient. If I want to say, you know, hey, what's the pop? Hey, Siri, what's the population of Omaha, Nebraska? Mm -hmm. I can figure that out relatively quickly, and I think that is a, a convenience thing that is helpful. Now, net net, is it positive? Uh, depends on who you are. For some people, it's a giant net negative because it's taking all of our time, all of our attention. It's a gigantic distraction. That 79th organ that is in our pocket or now just in our hands, we're walking around like zombies staring at these glowing screens. Mm. And so is our technology improving our lives? Yes, but... Who said that we need to improve our lives? Mm. And that's... We often think that improving our lives is a good thing but improving our lives simply means improving it yeah. it's not inherently good if what if we improve our lives so much that we lose the essence of who we are we lose the struggle we lose the friction that makes us human yeah. and so christy what you're talking about is these tech companies are removing a lot of the friction from our lives which which sounds great at first but when you take away all the friction you lose traction you go careening from side to side, you're going to fall into whatever ditch is over there because you're not able to, to sort of keep your vehicle on the road. Yeah. Well, all these technologies, man, they're tools like they're and a tool is as good as its user. Yeah. So, you know, we have to just be careful with these tools that we pick up and be careful with how we use them. But, you know, are we, are we going to sit here and promote, um, what, what, it, we're not Luddites. What What is it? Luddism? Yeah. yeah. Luddism. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to promote Ludditism, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we will promote intentionality. And that's what we have to do with these technologies. We have to be intentional with them. Yeah. Yeah. So the Lud the original Luddites were, were people during the Industrial Revolution who tried to destroy the machines. Oh, wow. And and so they were called the Luddites, right? And so like they would try to destroy any any machine that was... They were just yeah. against advancement. Yes. Yeah. And there are, there's a whole neo-Luddite movement and they have a lot to recommend. It makes a whole lot of sense because it is disconnecting us from our humanity. But mm. You're right. The broad sweeping, well, let's just blow it all up is also not the answer. Now, Ryan is absolutely right. These are tools. These they're uh, they're different tools now because unlike a hammer, a hammer was not engineered by large teams of people to distract you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mm. And so, we have to be cognizant of the goals of the technologists, of the manufacturers, of the people who are trying to aggregate our eyeballs, our attention onto the products and services, because they don't use the hammer to sell carpenters a whole bunch of different things. But our <laughs> phone is right there in our hand all the time, trying to sell us inadequacy, mm. make us feel inadequate. Therefore, you'll buy the product or service, the, the hair replacement product or the erectile dysfunction pill or the, the uh, sleeping supplements or whatever it might be. Because if you just buy this thing, then you'll be more complete. If you just yeah. upgrade your technology, then you'll be more complete. Dude, you know I'm going to interrupt you guys for just a second. Off mic, uh, we're looking at this from the lens of able-bodied people too. So to keep in mind that some of these technologies, like opening a door, uh -huh. somebody that doesn't yeah. have the capability. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, so so uh, podcast Sean is talking about how 
uh, someone who isn't as abled body, like opening a door for them. So kind of like I said at the very beginning of this, there are certain situations where this is totally going to be uh, going to be useful for people. It's going to be a game changer. So is the microchip that Elon Musk is trying to put in our brains. In fact, he is uh, specifically looking at um, like quadriplegics who who can uh, do certain things just by thinking. So yes, certainly there's always there's always going to be an exception, and uh, this could be game changer for for people in those types of situations. Totally agree, podcast on. I'll tell you one thing that drives me crazy though. I cannot turn off the one click purchasing when I buy a book. I don't know why that is. I have Googled it. I have like tried, I've turned off one click purchasing on Amazon, but like for whatever reason, dude, like they do not let you turn it off. Like when you're buying an audiobook or when you're buying a book uh, and it's like one of the most frustrating things because I hate doing the one click purchasing. Uh-huh. I'm probably going to hit, you know, add to cart and then check out. But the fact that I don't even have the option, like they're just, they're taking away as much friction as possible, man. Right. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, we get, yeah. You got to be careful. They're, they're, they want all your money. They want all your time. They want all your attention. You're being and, programmed to consume, right? Yeah. And you are being programmed for convenience. Yeah. Now, as podcast Sean brings up, yeah, of course, there are some applications, medical applications, mm-hmm. um, and, and other applications for our technology mm-hmm. that save lives and even the playing field for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. We were up in Seattle recently. We had a tour stop up there and I was at this coffee shop and they had, you know, a a stairway and there was a person who came in on a, in a electronic wheelchair, but they also had a, one of those little elevators that brings them from one floor to another. Right. Mm -hmm. And that meant they were able to sit in the restaurant literally right next to where I was yeah. and they wouldn't have been able to do so without that right. advancement. So yeah. those things are wonderful. The The problem we run into is when we prioritize convenience over everything else, mm. our lives become imminently convenient, mm-hmm. but they start to lose the meaning because, well, we're just doing things because they're easy. Yeah. We're not doing things to simplify our lives necessarily. Yeah. And just to really reiterate this conversation we're having, we're not putting a judgment on these things. No. These aren't good or bad. They just are. And uh, I just want to be clear with that. Like, this isn't saying like, oh, if you get one of those automatic doors, you're a bad person and (laughs) you're lazy and you're not a minimalist. It's not what we're saying. Yeah. No. Well, but here's the other thing. Maybe you are lazy. Mm. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. I, I'm i lazy sometimes too, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, we're all lazy with respect to something. Mm-hmm. Not everyone, you know, there's one Jocko Willink in the world and he's like getting up at 4.30 and, and conquering the world or whatever, right? But like, yeah, sometimes we sleep in. Is that lazy? Okay, mm-hmm. fine. I it, As soon as you remove all, even the judgment out of something like that is, yes, it, me microwaving something as opposed to cooking it in the oven mm. is lazy. Mm. And it's okay to do it as well. Mm. Voice, even, activa- voice activated potato. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, even Henry David Thoreau, the, sort of the the epitome of, of uh, self-reliance, his mother did his laundry for him when he was living out on Walden Pond. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's a book Ryan and I wrote almost a decade ago now, Ryan. How crazy is that? Man. Actually, the first draft was written this year, and uh, uh, well, 10 years ago this year, uh, 20, 2012. And uh, it was the, the thing that really took off for us. And, and a lot of people found value in that book. It was this journey of these two suit and tie corporate guys becoming minimalists and eventually the minimalists and the Boston globe called it like Henry David Thoreau, but with Wi-Fi. <laughs> and so if you enjoy the podcast, you'll enjoy the audio book version of everything that remains. It's still our most popular book to date. Or if you want the book book or the ebook version of everything that remains, we'll send that to you as well. Christy. Alabama, do we have any questions or comments from the live stream yet? No questions just yet, but we do have plenty of warm greetings from Denmark, California, Louisiana, Australia, Chile, Ohio, and a special hello from our Emma the Immigrant over in Canada. Oh, Emma. Oh, outstanding. Hey, Emma. Beautiful. Well, and we'll, everyone else. <laughs> we'll get to much more from the live stream during the Maximal episode this Thursday over on Patreon. But Ryan, in the meantime, what time is it? 
You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937 937- Two zero two four six five four. Yes, indeed. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer questions with a, a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place, minimalmaxims.com. Thanks to our good friend, Jessica Lynn Williams, social Jess. Looks like uh, Shannon has a question for us, Alabama. My ex-husband used to come home with big purchases without ever consulting me. How can we get our partners to include us in the buying process? I think Shannon uh, took the the advice that you give about you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. <laughs> 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 Considering yeah. this is her ex-husband, it sounds like she... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> took that advice. I imagine what the big purchases are, but I, they're like yeah. it's just like this giant foam hand from a get. Like <laughs> they're just really big things that he brought yeah, home. Right. Um, what are some things? And we're going to talk about this a bit. Uh, some purchases that annoyed us on the Maximal episode because we've had partners, significant others, spouses, friends, family who have given us surprises mm. that have really annoyed us. But let's let's talk to Shannon here specifically and. And I think what she realized, here's my pithy answer, and we can we can unpack it. To be on the same page, you must first read from the same book. Mm, now, amen. I think with Shannon, what she realized is they just weren't reading from the same book, right? Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's okay to be on different pages yeah. because that just means that you have different preferences, you have different uh, abilities, you have different time frames, you have different pace. The, mm-hmm. than someone else. So you're not always going to be exactly on the same page. I love this analogy because I'm a slow reader. So uh, Mariah's a little bit faster than me. So if we're reading out of the same book, um, yeah, she's going to get to page 50 before I before I am. However, maybe we have, you know, a conversation yeah. at page 50. And so we kind of have some patience for one another. Mm. To uh to you know to to make sure that we've read everything, then we can have a conversation rather than her being on page fifty and being like, "Why aren't you here yet? Hurry up, read." Yeah, yeah. And, and then if you were to extend that, if she, she were saying, "Hey, let's talk after page 50 and you're like, "Okay," but then you go off and read a different book, and you're like, "All right, now I'm on page fifty. I'm ready to talk <laughs> right. to you." Yeah, you're not going to be communicating, right? Mm-hmm. And and so. I think that's the key here. What I'm really saying is if you don't have similar values, then one of you is going to get dragged in a different direction. And it's not going to feel good for either party, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, My pithy answer is this. Compassion is key to understanding others. So if you have a spouse that is going out and making surprise purchases or annoying purchases, instead of, you know, judging them, Uh, Instead of yelling at them or making them feel bad, approach it with compassion. And this is this is really good advice for a lot of difficult conversations for conflict. Uh, We were talking about conflict at our um, Los Angeles event uh, a couple nights ago. And uh, when you approach conflict with compassion, it's so much easier to get somewhere that both people want to be. So. Uh, how do you approach someone with compassion who's buying purchases? Get to the understanding of why. Why do they a Why do they feel compelled to buy these purchases? And b Why do they feel uh, not compelled to talk to you about it? Mm-hmm. Getting to those questions is go- is going to help. Now, there's no magic spell that you can you know put on your partner. There's no uh, uh, you know tweetable answer Josh and I can give that's going to just all of a sudden make your partner do everything that you want them to do. But, you know, uh, that that's okay because a relationship, especially a romantic relationship, it's about the give and the take. There is no such thing. And in, in my opinion, I mean, maybe there is an exception to this, right? But a perfect relationship doesn't exist, mm-hmm. right? And if I actually, you know, somehow could date a female version of myself, that would probably be miserable too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, appreciating these differences and and looking at this as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship like that's going to be so much more powerful than just scalding uh, a partner who came home with a bowling ball that said homer on it <laughs> yes, yes. yeah and 
so when you're talking about compassion, what we're really talking about is seeing the suffering in someone else and being mm. with them for that, right? Yeah. And so that that's literally what compassion means. It means with suffering. That, mm. That's the, the sort of Latin root of compassion. And so mm. what Ryan is saying here is to understand them, you want to understand the, their suffering, their pain yeah. points. Because what led to that big purchase? You know, if your ex-husband bought a $10,000 watch and you are struggling to pay the rent and he's like, oh, I put $2,000 down and now I'm paying eight grand over the next 36 months or something. These things happen. In fact, Ryan, when we're out on tour, I've been reading this section from our latest book, Love People Use Things, mm -hmm. uh, about this couple in Minneapolis who where their relationship was really ruined. And I talk about they have all these money problems. Their mm. sex life was non-existent. Yep. They were bickering over small things. But then ultimately, they hid purchases for each from each other. Yeah. And as soon as I read that line, the whole crowd gets real silent like, uh-oh. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. The, the hiding something from other people means I'm ashamed of who I am. I'm ashamed of doing this. I'm ashamed of what you might think of me. And so it shows a lack of compassion in the relationship. If I'm ashamed to admit my mistake or my preferences or my values or my desires, if I have shame around that, mm. well, then, well, it makes it difficult for me to communicate with the person that I love. Mm. But if you can show up and say, hey, look, there's no shame here. I understand that you're suffering, I'm suffering, there's some suffering behind this. Mm -hmm. Because I actually see both sides of, uh, of this with Shannon. I also understand I don't want to get permission from my wife to purchase something. Mm -hmm. But I, all, I do talk to her about any time we're going to bring something into the house. We, we have a rule together. Before we bring any new purchase into the house, we're going to agree on it together. Mm -hmm. It's not that I need her permission but I don't want to bombard her with surprise purchases. Yeah. Ryan, we got a bunch more to talk about, but first, real quick, right here, right now, one thing going on in the life of the minimalists. We're the only podcast that I know of that doesn't ask this every episode. You know, people like and subscribe and hit the bell notifications. And no, 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 no. You do whatever you want to do. If you like it, you subscribe. You, you know how to, you can figure all that out. But once a year, in fact, last year, we forgot to ask about this. We recorded an episode that never came out. And so we, we were going to ask this last year. So we ask literally once or twice a year if you'd be willing to give us an annual performance review. Mm. Head on over to Apple Podcasts. Uh, I think it's just Apple dot or Apple Podcast dot com slash The Minimalists. Even if you don't listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, this helps us reach more people. If you listen to this podcast or view this podcast on YouTube, would you be willing for two minutes today, right now, to pause the podcast and leave us an honest review? Because that allows us to reach more ears, more eyes. It gets our simple living message into more homes. There's no advertisements. We're 100% advertisement free. And we don't come on here every episode asking you to like and subscribe and click here and do this. And once a year, mm. would you be willing to leave us a review? If it's five stars, wonderful. If it's not, totally understand as well. If it's one star, why the hell are you still listening? <laughs> but uh, we would really appreciate it. So if you'd be willing, just go to applepodcast.com slash The Minimalist or open up your Apple Podcast app and type in The Minimalist. Leave us a rating and a review. That would help us out a lot. And you won't hear about this next week or the week after that or the week after that. This is the one time we're going to ask. So now is the time to do it. Alabama, what do you got for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Hey guys, this is Nikki from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. I just listened to your podcast called Media, and I actually have an app recommendation. Um, I do have an Android, but I'm pretty sure there's an iOS and iPhone app out there that's similar. Um, it's called App Detox. And I love it because it allows you to restrict and even block access to apps on your phone. So I personally use it for Facebook and Instagram, and I allow myself a 30-minute time limit each day. Um, but at times, especially when I find myself getting lost in the infinite scroll of the news feeds, I'll actually block access completely. So I think that this has added a lot of value to my life, and I think it can add value to a lot of other listeners' lives as well. 
I wanted to call in to share a recent revelation that I had, which has removed numerous roadblocks I've come up against on my quest for a more minimalist lifestyle, the public library. I hadn't been to the public library since about high school, and I can't believe I had forgotten all of the free resources available at my local library that previously I had been routinely and wastefully paying for. Movies and movie rentals, magazines and magazine subscriptions, books, many of which, if I decided to purchase and not rent, lingered around in my house collecting dust until I got around to minimizing them. Even the due date on the materials I get from the library now is helpful. It motivates me to complete the book or magazine in a timely manner, allowing me to fit in more information over time, which I enjoy since I tend to mosey through those items if I own them, and my interest often grows cold. I'm saving even by having a quiet, well-lighted location with plenty of space and outlets to do work, something I had actually been paying money for by working in places like Starbucks or Barnes & Noble, where I felt pressured to purchase a coffee or snack in exchange for the work location. I don't have those pressures at the library, which is good for my wallet and my health. In fact, I realized I was actually losing money by not using the library since the tax dollars that I necessarily pay were going towards the upkeep of the library, which I was not utilizing. I encourage, I encourage all of those who are looking for a more minimalist lifestyle but who don't want to sacrifice the luxury of indulging in printed or digital media in a pleasant workspace outside of the home to rediscover their public library and other free offerings in their community. Something that's simple and easy. All right, Ryan. So this is really what the added value segment's for. I'm going to get to this added value here in a moment because I just did something, redid something that added immense value to my life over the course of the last year. And I want to mm. share it with you. I want to share it with the audience because I think you might get value from it as well. But first, here is a kind testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon supporters. This is from Ray Hamilton. She says, after a year of listening to the minimalists, I'm starting to better understand my values and I'm learning to prioritize my mental health and relationships. Mm. I was fresh out of college, working two jobs, a low grade hoarder straight out of a toxic relationship and had more issues than I could name. Since then, I've rearranged what I focus on, simplified my life, cut out unhealthy friends and prioritized my mental health. So here I am, a new private podcast member to support the people who taught me so much and continue learning how to choose myself over society's expectations. Oh, Ray. Wow. Thank you so much. And Ray, thank you for using an Oxford comma. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Sean has a whole box of them. <laughs> he traded them for one M dash though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ray, thank you so much. We're, we're grateful that you are one of our Patreon supporters. Every week we do a long form maximal episode. They're completely separate from this minimal episode. We uh, we let our hair down, roll up our sleeves and other mixed metaphors. <laughs> it really is the private space. We're able to have some more in-depth, more open conversations. But for added value this week, Ryan, over the last year, Bex and I rewatched my favorite TV show. She had never seen it. I hadn't seen it in t about 20 years. Yeah. So the pilot actually came out 20 years ago next month. Oh, wow. It's called The Shield. Yeah, great show. There's seven seasons of it. And I got to tell you that it first aired in 2002, and then it aired for the next seven seasons. And so it has been off the air for like, what, almost 15 years at this point. And I realized it's simultaneously timeless. And it's also quintessentially oddies. It takes place in that period where flip phones were ubiquitous. Oh, right. It's in Los Angeles. So I saw it completely differently because I had never even been to Los Angeles the first time I watched this whole series. And I also watched it differently. I, I watched it over the course of seven years. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. on FX, <laughs> commercials yeah. and all. Yeah. And, and now... I went back and watched it. We'd watch a couple a week, and that's why, and sometimes uh, toward the end, we, we were watching more than that. But um, it was also a show that was before social media, and it was a popular, it was a hit show, mm -hmm. but I think it would have been like the biggest show in the world if social media would have been around at the time yeah, because it puts you in this universe and rewatching it really solidified it as my favorite show of all time. And it's, it's weird because it's a, it's a cop show. Mm -hmm. And it's predicated on 
ram the whole rampart scandal that happened in the late nineties. Oh, really? Yeah, it, you know they closed that whole rampart division. There was this whole crash team, which I think was like it, 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 in the show. It's called the strike team, but it was these cops who are. Are they good cops? Are they bad cops? In fact, mm. in the very first episode, the pilot episode, there's this line and there's this, he's trying to catch this pedophile, the main character, Vic Mackey. And after they, they've interrogated this guy a bunch and, and then finally Vic comes in the room and he goes, oh, what I get it. Are you the bad cop? And uh, Vic says, no, good cop and bad cop went, went home for the day. Mm-hmm. I'm a different kind of cop. <laughs> and that's really it. Like, yeah. Yeah, he's a bad cop who does good things or a good cop who does bad things. Like, you don't really know. And then eventually, as the the show sort of unfurls, Mm -hmm. you realize that it explores the absurdity of good and bad because we're all good people who do bad things and we're all bad people who do good things, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But it, it is a cop show, but it's also high art. Like, this is... It is a masterpiece. It's well of the done. Show. Yeah, I remember really enjoying it. I have not seen all seven seasons, so I'll have to put that on our our watch list. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing about this, Ryan, is it has the best ending of any show, and that's what really makes it the best. Oh, okay. It's such an unexpected ending. It's perfect. It's poetic. It's exactly what should happen, mm. but you would never expect this ending. It's and. In the seasons, they it's one of these rare shows. You know, it, like some shows are cash grabs. They keep going and going. And like first two seasons were great, like yeah. House of Cards or whatever. And then all of a right. sudden it's like, okay, no, no, no. This show, season five is probably the best season. Oh, wow. And then season seven is probably the second best season. Oh, awesome. And the last two episodes are two of the best episodes in all of TV history. <laughs> it's awesome. Unbel- and you fall in love with these characters. And it's weird because... I feel like you you love the characters and you hate them. Mm-hmm. How three D is that? I mean, there are people in our lives where it's like, I love you so much, I hate you right now, mm-hmm. right? Oh man, I really appreciate the, I don't know, the the TV shows, the movies that they kind of blur this good and bad mm-hmm. because that's how life is. Yes, like it's that that's real life. There's no one who's a hundred percent good. There's no one who's a hundred percent bad. And the bad people have their reasons and the good people have their reasons. But being able to like show that in art in an art form like a TV show, like I really do appreciate that. And it's I think 88 episodes total. So you're talking about almost a hundred hour movie is the way that I look at it. Mm-hmm. And so you get to know these people. And mm. I remember when it finished, Ryan, when it ended, I felt like I'd lost something. Mm. There was like a week where I was feeling depressed after I and I had already mm. seen the show. But the very last scene in the show, and you can't, you have to watch all seven seasons in order for it to be meaningful, but it stuck with me for 14 years. There were actually, there were two scenes. I didn't remember all the subplots and stuff, but I, there were two scenes that they just rattled me. Like they stayed in my bone marrow Mm. for almost two decades. And so it's available to stream on, I I actually, I tried to download it on iTunes, but it was the old SD version, you know, Uh, oh, it was four by three. Who wants to watch that? (laughs) And we are so privileged, man. (laughs) It was awful. And so I went to, I, I, I never had Hulu. So I went and got the ad free version of Hulu Mm -hmm. and I, um, you can stream it there. Yeah. in HD. And it was, it was just right. And I tell you, man, it, by the end of it, I felt haunted. I felt exhausted. The characters have stuck with me. Michael Chiklis, who is the lead actor in there, amazing. He plays True. Vic. Yeah. yeah. And then Walton Goggins plays Shane. Mm. I ran into Walton at Squirrel, our favorite restaurant, once. And I walked past him. I looked at him. And he looked at me and he points up. <laughs> and I pointed at him. Uh, and then I just walked by. That's funny. Um, but... Uh, Walton Goggins really steals the show. It is yeah. a crime that he didn't because Chickless got an Emmy for this, but Walton Goggins should have got seven Emmys for this. He is one of the best actors in the world. Wow, he's truly, truly amazing. So, the other thing I learned, Ryan, is I found this show because of the art. I found it deeply meaningful, and it made me, in a way, understand. You know, when people come up to us at our live event or on the street or whatever. I really find your work meaningful. Like it really sits with me. It resonates with me. Yeah. I, I found that with this, where I'm like so appreciative of the of Sean Ryan, the guy who who created the show. I'm so appreciative to him because they have stuck with me. And I know it's a cop show, but it's not a show about cops at all. They could be cooking. Like it, it's it's about the human experience. 
And it, the fact that it happens in this sort of police precinct, it amplifies that experience. But in fact, uh, afterward, I even dove into this podcast called The Shattered Shield because they talk about each episode. And I found like that was an, oh, yeah, they're seeing wow. different things about these characters. What a good idea for a podcast. Yes. Wow. They, they dove into every single episode. You, you can check that out as well. It's called The Shattered Shield. You can even sort of go along with the characters. I wish I could recommend one episode. That, uh, here's Because, yeah, the, the, the season finality of the fifth season is a great place not to start, but it's a great episode. Mm. You got to start with the pilot. In fact, the pilot isn't indicative of the rest of the show. It's not as good as the rest of the show, but it's often considered one of the best pilots in TV history. Mm. And it's a stunning, shocking pilot when you watch it. Yeah, I do remember the pilot. It's, yeah, Woo. shocking is a great word. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that podcast, The Shatter Shield, they do like these in-depth recaps. They do the cast interviews with people who are actually on the show, like Michael Chiklis and, and, uh, and, Shane, Shane Vandrell, the Walton Goggins character, and uh, a bunch of other people as well. And so, um, yeah, you, you got to start with season one if you're going to watch it. And I will even say that season one, even though it's great, it's the weakest of all seven seasons. Mm. And so it's uh, sort of getting their their footing. But by season two and then season three, oh, mm. I mean, it's a whole world that you can't wait to like get yourself back into. Yeah, it, rem it reminds me of The Wire, kind of. I yes. mean, they're, they're kind of similar. But The Wire, the ending of that was horrible. I didn't think it was horrible. It wasn't nearly as... I don't, it wasn't I don't, bookended. Yeah, and they, right. They, they, well, they left it on a cliffhanger. Well, teed up for the next season. I guess they probably did that in expecting another season to come out. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting. Um, I'll tell you this, though. The, the ending of The Shield, I saw it like... There's two or three ways to interpret it. Mm. And I, the first time I watched, I interpreted it one way. Yeah. But 15 years later, I interpreted this one completely differently, even though it's the same exact scene. And I remember it. It's burned into my brain. But uh, mm. such a great show. The Shield. <laughs> yeah. You can find it on uh, an HD <laughs> on know, Hulu. You know what I remember um, The Shield most for? What's that? Uh, you know, of course, this is like my 19 year old self, 20 year old self. Um, on FX, they really pushed the boundaries with um, nudity. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being like this big, um, almost scandal in a way where like they were just, they were like pushing right up as yeah. far as they could to that line. The funny thing is there might be like one nipple. In right, seven exactly. Seasons. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But they, they were, I'm gl glad you mentioned that, right? Because it was on FX. This was the first big show on cable television. Oh yeah, the That's very right. uh, on regular cable television. This is I mean, the Sopranos were obviously the progenitor to this on HBO, mm -hmm. but on regular cable TV, and so no one really knew what the rules were because before then you couldn't even smoke on camera and you couldn't have prostitutes on camera, like all of these different things. Yeah. and they they were like, well, these aren't actual rules; these are just assumed rules, and so they started breaking all these rules, and it made for. Just, I mean, the acting, the directing, yeah. the camera work, mm -hmm. it's like having another character. Yeah. The the, ca the camera work, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, and I feel like um, it's not very gratuitous either. Like when they, no, when not they, at all. like it's very intentional. It's not like, oh, here's here's some nudity for the sake of it. Like it's, yeah, it, it, it is not gratuitous. It, there are shocking scenes, but there's nothing gratuitous. Yeah. Shocking in the sense that like, oh my God, I didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. But of course it was going to happen. You see it in retrospect like, yes. That was going to happen. So if you want to give it a shot, you can start with the pilot, season one. It's, uh, man, what a great show. By the way, Ryan, we have a bunch more surprise questions this week, like what are some purchasing rules that can strengthen or save a relationship? What surprise purchases have personally annoyed Joshua and Ryan? How can you hit the calm switch when you feel overwhelmed? Plus a million more questions for The Minimalist. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist private podcast. Visit patreon.com slash The Minimalist to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain immediate access to hundreds of hours of private archives, recordings of live events, exclusive home tours, and our private community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at The Minimalists. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Malabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, 
Danny Unknown, M of the Immigrant, and the rest of our team. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn, reminding you to love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it